So today we have a special guest speaker. Um, his name is Tommy Lee. He is the president of Resource Global. Um, I've just got to meet him today. Uh, he has a daughter who is four years old and a baby. Um, My wife is seven months pregnant. Seven months pregnant. And, and what Reina tells me that he, you're, you're a great boss, you're a family man. <laughs> um, and you said that you're just, Pastor Dave has a lot of good things to say about you. So we're excited to have you here. So can we give him a warm welcome, please? Thank you very much. I want to make sure I respect your time, so I'm glad there's a clock right there. Uh, my name is Tommy Lee. I actually, I have a, uh, my wife is seven months pregnant, and so we have a baby girl, and so now it actually is up to me and my four-year-old daughter to determine the name. And so my wife is Charlene, so my name was Kara for, uh, uh, for our daughter. So I asked Samantha, so I said, Samantha, what do you want to name your baby sister? Her name was Ariel Cinderella Bell Lee. Yes, yeah, so I think we got rid of that idea pretty fast. Uh, it is great to be here. I live and was born and raised in Chicago, Illinois, so I've lived in the U.S. pretty much all my life. I get a chance to come out here to Jakarta for about three or four times a year. And so a lot of times for my, me, when I started my journey, I'm 42 years old. And so I went to college thinking I was going to be a doctor, all right? Was it profound that I wanted to be a doctor? No. Pretty much a lot of times, I'm not sure if you guys understand that, my parents gave me three options for me and my brother. Doctor, lawyer, engineer, pick one. And so I said, well, I like chemistry a lot, so I picked uh, chemistry and was going to be a doctor. After the first year, I realized, yeah, I am not going to be a doctor, so I enrolled in business. Did I know what I was going to do in business? No, I had no idea what I was going to do in business. So I actually majored in management. After I graduated, did I know what I was going to do with my life? I had zero clue what I was going to do with my life. And I actually ended up working in this company that built cell towers. And so a lot of times, I started out at the bottom of the company, and for 12 years, my role was building cell towers for like Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, different things like that. Loved it. Loved every minute of it. And I thought I was going to be there for a long time. I had no intention of leaving. During that period of time, I'm volunteering with my church. I live near Chinatown in Chicago. And so we actually had a college ministry, a high school ministry. So I had about 90 college students. So I thought I was going to work with college students, work full time, and volunteer at the church, right? And so a lot of times... Uh, this church says, I have to speak to this group once a week on Friday nights. And 90 college students had no zero clue what I was going to talk about. So I said to the church, well, I don't know what to do. They said, well, you need to go to seminary. And we'll pay for seminary, but you've got to take a full load. So now I'm working full time, and I'm taking four classes uh, uh, for a semester. And so that's what I did. After seminary, I thought, well... Lord, are you calling me to be a pastor, like Pastor Anthony and Pastor Dave? So I tried it for three years, and I realized I didn't want to be a pastor. God did not call me to be a pastor, and it's okay. I could still be doing ministry and not be in full-time ministry because that's not my, what my calling is. Got hired at this Bible college called Moody Bible Institute, and so my role was special assistant to the president. And so I did major donor fundraising. We have pastor's conference, founder's week. So I thought, okay, Lord, you're going to put me there, and I'm going to be there because every single president is there for about 10 to 12 years. Well, after four years, he says, Tommy, I'm resigning because of health reasons. Well, I thought I was going to be here with you for the next 10 years. And so I transitioned now that. So now I've gotten a chance to look at business, corporate, pastor, different things like that. And so for the last nine years... We've been working on this initiative called Resource Global. What does it mean to engage marketplace leaders in different global cities, beginning in Jakarta, then Chicago, and now Nairobi, Malaysia, Singapore, Los Angeles, and Orange County? Because you guys are the key. You're the catalyst for gospel work in different, in throughout the entire world. How do you begin to integrate your faith and work? How do you begin to look at justice and mercy, your story, in terms of what the gospel can do through you in your work in the city. Now, at the same time, we'll say this, and I'm going to jump into the passage. People ask me, Tommy, did you know you were going to do this 20 years ago when you graduated college? Zero clue. So 
how did you end up to where you are? For me, my voice, sometimes God calls you to be a doctor. Sometimes he calls you to be a dentist, family business, startup. He's very clear. For me, I didn't have that clarity. I was merely faithful to where God had me at that very moment. I was very faithful and did the job as best as I can. Now, I look at my time at Resource Global, the very things I'm learning, I learned from my corporate degree in terms of project management. I learned my time at pastor, learned my time. Everything I'm doing, God has prepared me and all the skills brought me to where I am right now. How long am I gonna be at Resource Global? I don't know. Maybe it's a year, maybe 10 years from now, but am I faithful to where God is calling me to be? And so a lot of times, hey, today we're going to talk about a passage. Uh, we're going to look at the whole story of Gideon in Judges chapter 6. And so our theme today in our short time together is that ordinary people, God uses ordinary people like you and I to do extraordinary things. And that's what the story of Gideon teaches us. So if you have your Bible, let's take a look at Judges chapter 6. It's right after Joshua, right in the Old Testament, Judges chapter 6. I'm going to look at it from the NIV, okay? Judges chapter 6, verse 1. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. You're going to see that theme over and over again in the book of Judges. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. That is the story ever since from Joshua, now, and then the story of Judges. They went through all these different Judges. And that's what the Israelites did over and over again. And for seven years, he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, not only just the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the other eastern people invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkey. When there was crop harvest time, they're all coming. And when they're coming, they're bringing all the other people and they're all coming to grab their feet, feet, uh, food and not sparing the Israelites anything. That's the context. They camped on the land, uh, Verse 5, they came up with their livestock and their teams like swarms of locusts. I love that imagery, swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count the men in their camels. They invaded the land to what? To ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they finally cried out to the Lord for help. I wonder if you look at that, if you feel the pain and all that stuff. This was their harvest. Whenever the Israelites, when it was harvest time, they knew and all of their enemies knew it was time to come. And they came and stole all their food. To a small degree, I kind of understand that. I was born in, uh, my parents immigrated into Chicago in the U.S. in 1972. I was born in 1977. And I grew up initially in Chinatown, Chicago, but right after that we moved out to the outskirts in this neighborhood called Bridgeport. Bridgeport was right next to Chinatown. If you look at Bridgeport now, it's 80% Asian. But when I moved there and went to school there about 83, 84 years old, I was one of five Asians in that particular neighborhood. And so that area was for the most part pretty racist and not used to Asians. And my brother and my sister and I would walk to school every single day. And I still remember when we were in fourth grade, there was this eighth grader who wanted to pick on us and bully us wherever we went. And so we would go there, and after school, my brother and sister and I would find different roads to go. Well, is he going to meet us there? Is he going to meet us there? But every single day for about half a year, he always found us. And he always messed with us every single day. And you couldn't get rid of him. And so a lot of times when we look at the story, these Israelites could not get rid of them. And it got to the point that they were so involved, impoverished, they finally, finally cried out to the Lord for help. Sometimes God, in the midst of all those different things, will use trials to really be able to bring us back to his attention. 
When everything is going well, we're not paying attention, right? But sometimes in the midst of getting our attention, God uses trials. Not if, but when God uses to really be able to get our attention. Let's keep moving on. When the Israelites cried to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who says, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them from before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. But you have not listened to me. Here's a key point in verse 11. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Oprah that belonged to Joash the Abyssalite, where his son Gideon was what? Threshing wheat in a wine press. Note that this is going to be very important to the story. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he says, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. If you have your Bible, if you have an app, everything like that, if you're able to highlight it, underline it, highlight that. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. What's very key? Because when you start looking at the passage and you start reading that, as soon as you get to this part, you're going to say, wait, there's something wrong with this. It doesn't make sense. Why? Because we have to understand the context of it. What was Gideon doing? He was threshing wheat. Where? In a wine press. Well, understand the historical nature of that. How do you thresh wheat? Well, during harvest time, when it's time for harvest, you bring and you take a sickle and you start cutting all of the wheat. You bring all of the wheat onto what? Not a wine press, but a threshing floor. And so what do you know about threshing floor? It is usually located on an open area. It is located usually on top of a hill where there's a lot of breeze or a lot of air. You lay out all of that wheat on this threshing floor. From that point on, you take a little hammer like a flail and you start hitting it. Or for some people, you have cattle or you have oxen who step on this wheat. It now separates the straw, which is lighter, from your grain. You then take this winnowing fork, which is a big break in some sense, and you lift it as high as you can. The grain, which is heavier, falls in one pile. The straw, which is another pile, which is lighter, falls in another pile. There's seed coverings or chaff. They're flying all over the place. So you understand why you have to have it in an open area, right? So where is Gideon threshing wheat at? Wine press. What is weird about a wine press? I did not know what a wine press was until I spent about three weeks in Jerusalem. During one of the time, we went to the garden tomb where Jesus was supposedly uh, <clears throat> buried and came out to life. And there in front of the garden tomb is a wine press. And pretty much a wine press is a rectangular hole. It really is that rectangular hole about waist high. And from that point on, you lay out all your grapes and there, there is a hole within that rectangular hole that really leads to a bunch of cisterns or jars. And as you lay and step all over these grapes, the juice goes and flows into this little hole into these jars. It's an enclosed area. And so why was Gideon threshing wheat in a wine press? He was scared. What does the angel of the Lord say to him? The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Whoa, 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 wait. Let's time out, Lord. Mighty warrior. Lord, are we reading the same passage? Are we looking at the same thing, Lord? Are you seeing? Because when I look at Gideon, I'm not seeing a mighty warrior. I'm seeing a coward. I'm seeing someone who's scared. I'm seeing a wimp. Mighty warrior? Are you serious? Point number one, God's picture of us is sometimes different than the picture we have of ourselves or the picture that others have of us as well, too. For us, we look at Gideon and we see this guy who is not courageous at all, who is scared and afraid. God sees him a mighty warrior. God's picture of us many times is different than the picture we have of ourselves and that others have of us. I grew up in a family where I have an older twin brother who's two minutes older than I am. 
I grew up in a pair where I have a younger sister who's two years younger than I am. I'm one of those guys who, when they had to study, had to spend that extra time rewriting my notes, paying attention to my lectures, and spend many weeks studying for an exam in order to get that A or to get that B. My twin brother, who was two minutes older, was a lot smarter than I am. In high school, I was overweight. My younger sister was a genius, perfect SAT, perfect ACT, got into Yale, perfect scores there. And so I, growing up, I was always the, not the smartest one. I was always the chubby one in the family as well, too. Friends would acknowledge that, everything like that. And so a lot of times, I grew to the point where I struggled with self-esteem. And it wasn't until I got to the church and began to understand how God has created me with a certain unique characteristic that he loves me based upon who I am with my skills that I began to understand who God has me for. And for many of you guys, you may look at your life and you're sitting there, well, I'm not this, I'm not that. But God has designed you with a new name. God has made you unique because God's picture of you many times is different than the one that you have of yourself or that others may have of you. Let's keep going on. But sir, Gideon replied in verse 13, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. Look at verse 14. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? But Lord Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the weakest in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites together. I want you to highlight uh, verse 15. But Lord Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. You know what he's essentially saying? Hey, look, Lord, you're calling me a mighty warrior, right? Do you not understand where I am and what, where I belong? Out of all the clans here, my clan's the weakest. And Lord, you may not understand this, but out of all the weakest and out of all the people in this weakest clan, I am the weakest in this weakest clan. Lord, do you know where that puts me? Dead last. Right there at the end. Look, notice what the Lord says doesn't say to him, he never disagrees with him. He never says to Gideon, well, you know, Gideon, really, you kind of have it wrong. Your clan isn't the weakest. So-and-so's clan is kind of weaker. And, you know, technically, that person is kind of weaker than you, so you're not. He never disagrees with him. And he says to Gideon, hey, look, I'm not disagreeing with you. You know why? Because I made you. I made your clan the weakest. I made you the weakest in the weakest clan. I made you who you are. It's a similar story in all of us. Lord, I'm not the smartest person in the room. God doesn't disagree with that. You're not the smartest person in the room. Lord, I'm not the most talented. I'm not the most charismatic. Yeah, you're probably not the most talented or charismatic. Lord, I can't speak very well. I can't sing very well. Yeah, you're not supposed to be singing very well. If you can't sing where well, I know that. Lord, I'm not the best looking person in Rome. Yeah, yeah, I didn't give you the best looks in the world. Totally understand that. Because I made you to who you are. I made you unique. I gave you your strengths, but I gave you your weaknesses. Because you know why? It's never about you. The story has never been about you. God has made you with all your great talents and all your strengths, but he's also allowed you to have imperfections and areas of weaknesses. Because when we start doing things for the Lord, and look at what he says to them. He says, Gideon, look, I know all these different things, but go in the strength that you have. And when you go in the strength that you have, whatever you have, whatever weaknesses, insecurities you have, I will be with you. Because when things go well, when you start doing, I'm going to do something wonderful through you. It's never about you, but it's what the gospel can do through you. 
because it's never been about us. It's never been about what Tommy Lee can do. It's never about what so-and-so could do. Look at my strength. It's despite my weaknesses, despite my shortcomings, God is able to work in and through us in a way that he never could be doing. And so a lot of times when we start serving, people are going to look at us and say, wow, look at that person. He's not strong in these areas. He's not. But look at what God is able to do despite and all glory to our Savior, because it's never been about us. Go in the strength that you have, and I will be with you. Point number one, God's picture of us is different than the picture we sometimes have of ourselves or that others may have of us. That's point number one. Point number two, go in the strength that you have, and I will be with you. What's point number three? I want to take a look at verse, um, we're going to skip all the way to verse 25. And now God is called Gideon. He's about to fight the Midianites. It's the night before. Look at verse 25. That same night, the Lord said to him, Take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to bow and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a what? proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on the top of this height, using the wood, blah, 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 blah. Tear down the altar and build what? The proper kind of altar in its place. Before Gideon is sent to do something, God says, Gideon, I'm going to use you to do something amazing. I'm going to use you to fight the Midianites and save your people from there. But before you do, you got to do some business. You got to tear down that altar and you got to build the proper altar in its place. For many of us, God is saying the same thing. I have a plan for you. I am going to do something wonderful in your life, and I'm going to use you to make a difference in your city, in your work, and globally. But before you do, some of you have issues. Some of you have to do business with God. That there are some of you guys who need to tear down some of the altars in that life of yours and build and put the proper altar in its place. Before God can use some of us, there are issues that some of us have to come to grips with. There are heart issues, there are baggages, there are skeletons in your closet that you're going to have to face, that you're going to have to come to grips with, man on man. You're going to have to face it with fear. And you may not like it, but before God's going to use you, he loves you so much, he cares about your character. He cares about the conditions and the state of your heart. And he wants you to do business with him before he goes, sends you on somewhere else. And for some of us, let me talk about some of those hard issues. Because all of us have baggage. All of us have issues in our life. For some of us, we're sitting here and we deal with the issue of guilt. We may have things in our life that no one knows that's eating us. We may have done some things along the path in our life that we've been hiding for a long time. And we don't want anyone to know. But we just bury it deep in our life, and it continues to eat us. That no matter what we do in the whole realm of life we go through, there is something eating us. We struggle with guilt. Some of you may be struggling with the issue of guilt right now. Some of you may be struggling with the issue of anger. Anger toward your family. Anger toward your uh, parents. Anger toward your siblings or friends for things they could have done to us for very well reason. They may have hurt you along the way. Anger because you may have not gotten a promotion even though you worked really hard at it. Anger because your startup is not going very well. Anger because you had dreams of accomplishing certain things. Having a relationship is just not working out well. We may be struggling with anger and you're angry at God, or you're angry at that person, you have to let go of that anger. For some of us, it's greed. We're struggling with greed. Because we love our money. We love our time. We love our vacations. We love our dream. And we're willing to give up some things to the Lord, but there are certain things in the Lord he's not touching. And for some of us, we do not want a religion or a God who tells us no. And so, Lord, we're going to let go of certain things and give it up to you, but there are certain things you're not touching. And so we struggle with greed. 
For some of us, maybe jealousy. We're jealous because why does so-and-so have all the luck? Why does so-and-so in our family get preferential treatment? I work hard. Why doesn't these things happen to me? And we're just jealous. Some of us are going to deal with these heart issues. All of us, at one point or another, will deal with heart issues along the way. And it's easy to avoid it. Sometimes as Asians, I look out, most of us are here are Asians. We're taught to bury our feelings. We're taught not to deal with our feelings. we got to come to grips with it. Because sometimes, if we don't deal with it, eventually, it all comes out. We have what we call, I love to say, a shadow mission, right? For instance, a lot of times, you don't know me. I'm going to come here, speak for an hour. I'm gone, back to Chicago, and I can say the right things. I know the verses to say. I can even say a nice little prayer and throw in a couple of Jesus words. I look spiritual. I look like I have everything together. You may not, I may be hiding things in your life. Sometimes we have shadow missions. What I mean by that is we allow people to see who we want them to see. We give an image, but our shadows reflect what really is happening in our hearts. And is your life, you know, how you portray your life, what people see in line with your shadow. I love what one author says. He says this, our shadow missions have enormous destructive potential. The mission we devote ourselves to will shape us. Our unplanned, involuntary thoughts and wishes will spring out of it. Noble missions will give rise to noble thoughts, but shadow missions will produce an inner life of hidden darkness and destructive discontent. Shadow missions always destroy, eventually, that person and their loved ones and the people around them. That eventually, those hard issues that you think you could kind of bury, those hard issues of jealousy, greed, anger, guilt, eventually will eat you. And as time goes on, if we don't deal with some of those issues, it will affect not only your relationships, but also your heart, and also all your relationships, especially your kids or different things like that. For me, I, I dealt with that a couple years ago in 2017. I'm 42 years old, right? For the most part, I still think I'm pretty young. 19, thanks, Raina. In 2017, I was having some problems with my sinus. And I thought it was a simple sinus infection. Wasn't even thinking anything of it. And one day after Christmas, after New Year's, my nose started bleeding. And it bled for a whole hour. And I said, huh, that's strange. And for the next five days, it bled every night for a whole hour. Eventually, I actually had to go to the doctor. And the doctor says, Tommy, you have a four centimeter tumor in your nose. You may, I think it looks like you pretty much have cancer. And so for that, I had to go through surgery for my cancer. And the doctor says, for the next eight weeks, you're going to have to go through chemotherapy in your nose all the way to your neck. And you're going to have to go through radiation for the next eight weeks. And Tommy, I'm going to have to let you know this. You're going to have to live in pain for eight of those weeks. And when I say in pain, it's not going to be pretty. You're going to live in constant pain, never stopping. And he was right. That pain started out as a 3-4. I said, hey, this isn't too bad. To eventually a 10 to 12 on a scale. And that pain did not stop. I could not eventually have affected my nose. That pain went all the way to my throat, all the way, way through my mouth, eventually inside my neck and outside. It felt like they took something on my neck, took it against concrete and just rubbed it against concrete. It was that bad. And I lived in pain. And that pain never stopped. Eventually, I couldn't even eat solid food. I lost all my taste buds, all my saliva. To this day, I still have nothing left in terms of saliva. And eventually, I couldn't, since I couldn't eat solid food, I had to drink water. I mean, uh, liquids. And since I couldn't taste, have taste buds, it all tasted like I was drinking water for eight weeks. I lost 80 pounds in a matter of eight weeks. That pain was so bad, I could never sleep. They had me on so much morphine, my mind was delirious. And I spent almost the entire time in bed unless I had to go to the doctors. I would spend many nights sitting there in bed, three in the morning, 
just crying every single night. At times angry, at times frustrated, wondering why God allowed this to happen. And a lot of times someone asks me, he says, do you know why God allowed this to happen to you? And I would say, I don't. And it's so easy to get angry and bitter. But I had to trust God and depend on the words of Scripture during that period of time. All of us are susceptible to heart issues. All of us will deal with heart issues. All of us, because we deal with sinful people. We have people who hurt us. We have things that don't happen. We have parents who are imperfect. As much as they love us, they're going to hurt you with their words. Friends will hurt you. Life will deal with disappointments. Businesses will not go well. And when that happens, what are you going to do about it? Tear down the altar and put the proper altar in its place. I don't have too much time. I want to end in one thing. I want to show you one example of how this person did well. I want to take a look at Genesis chapter 33. All right? I'm going to end in this. Genesis chapter 33. Genesis is right in the book, of Gen uh, right in the beginning of the book. Jacob, you know the story of Jacob and Esau. Jacob was a younger brother of Esau. Esau and Jacob were supposed to have birthrights or inheritance. Esau, being the older brother, was supposed to get the extra inheritance. So pretty much a lot of times you take the entire family's wealth, divide it by three. Jacob gets one. Esau, being the older brother, gets the additional birthright or inheritance. Jacob conned his brother into giving him his birthright. Issue number one. So at the same time, Esau was a little bitter at him. Later on, Jacob conned his dad to give him the blessing which Esau was supposed to get. And so Esau was not getting the blessing which went to Jacob. And so Jacob, being the younger brother, scammed or conned his brother twice. Esau had every right to be angry. Esau had every right to take out and want to take out revenge. He was justified, right? And so they went their separate ways, and they started getting, look at this, they started getting successful. And one day, Jacob gets word that Esau wants to see him. Well, Esau's, Jacob's kind of scared. He thinks Esau is there to take revenge on him. Here's where the story takes place. Look at verse 33, verse 1. Jacob looked up, and there was Esau coming with his 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants. He put the maidservants and their children in front, Leah and his children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. He himself went on ahead and bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached the brother. But Esau, note this, who had every right to take revenge against his younger brother, what does he do? Ran to meet Jacob, his brother, and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. <laughs> And this, that's not even the important part to this story. Look at right, the verses right before that. Jacob looked up, and there was Esau coming with his 400 men, so he's scared. What does he do? He divides what? The children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants. This is the important part in verse 2. He put the maidservants and their children in front, no names of all the children, Leah and his children's necks, no names. And Rachel and who? Joseph in the rear. Why do you think the author of Genesis decided to tell us that Joseph was there that day? Joseph was there that day to see his uncle Esau, who had every right to take revenge on his father Jacob, the younger brother, who scammed him and conned him, who had every right to take revenge. He sees his older uncle do the best thing and forgive his younger brother. Jake, Joseph was there that day. And I think that's what the author of Genesis was telling us that day. That's why he's mentioned by name. Because you know, remember what happens to Joseph, right? 20 years later, he's sold to slavery by his brothers. Potiphar's wife situation ends up in jail. Later on, he himself, 20-something years later, who does he have to forgive? His brothers. His brothers are standing there, and he had to forgive them. 
I wonder if the book of Genesis and the author of Genesis was telling us that Joseph was there that day to watch his uncle forgive his father because later on, that lesson reminded him of how he had to forgive his brothers as well too. Do we never know in the midst of dealing with the hard issues, we never know when we're in the midst of dealing with those pain in our life, who's watching us. We never know whose life we're going to impact in a possible way. Joseph was impacted by his uncle in a way that we can never forget because 20 years later, he had to deal with the same thing. All of us are going to deal with sin in our lives. or Sin is going to affect us in a negative way. How are you going to come to grips with it? How is that going to affect it? Point number one, God's picture of us is different than the picture we have of ourselves and the picture that others have of ourselves. Point number two, go in the strength that you have, and I will be with you. No matter what your issues are, no matter what your shortcomings are, God is always with you. It may not always be easy. That's not what he promises, that life is going to be easy. He does promise he's going to be with you through thick and thin. Point number three, go put the proper altar. Tear down the altar and put the proper altar in its place. And so as we wrap up, you look at your life. Jealousy, guilt, anger, greed. Where's your heart? What is the state of your heart? As we talk about family values, we talk about making a difference for the sea, we talk about the gospel. What is the state of your heart? The gospel rescues us and propels us to do what we're able to do. We're able to forgive because of the gospel. We're able to have strength because of the gospel. We're able to do all these different things because of the gospel. May the gospel and the cross of Jesus Christ enable all of us to continue to choose rights. And that means sometimes even deal with the heart issues that is in our hearts. Where's your heart? Where are you right now? What pain do you need to deal with? What do you need to come before the Lord? as you deal with that pain. Let's pray. Father, I come before you and I pray for all these men and women here in this room. We pray for the state of their hearts. We pray for the issues and the baggage that some of us may be carrying right now here in this room. Maybe the issue of anger, maybe the issue of guilt, and maybe the issue of greed or jealousy, whatever it is. Father, may you continue to grant us the strength to really do what is right, to come before you and the cross and lay it and draw that strength from you to deal with it. We look at the story of Gideon, Lord, and look at how you work in ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And so, Lord, thank you for how you are giving us a new name, how you promised to be there with us. But, Lord, grant us the strength to deal with those heart issues, to continue to glorify you and make a difference in our lives and the lives of other people for your glory. In Christ we pray, amen. Thank you, Tommy. Such a great reminder from the story of Gideon. Thank you for being so vulnerable and open to us. It's a great challenge. and is. It's just to reaffirm that, you know, we have such a good, good God and that He is faithful. And as Tommy said, it's not up to us, but He will be with us and He will empower us. And I always remember that God is not going to lower His expectation based on our limitation. And He's going to continue to equip us and qualifies us uh, to do the things that He's called us to do and to be the people that He's called us to be. So thank goodness for that. Can we all at least stand up? We're going to worship the Lord one more time before we end our service. When man has fallen, when fear is coming, still you're calling me. When faith is lost and my hope exhausted, you will be my strength. When my mind says I'm not good enough, God, you're enough for me. I decided I'm not giving up. You won't give up on me. You won't give up on me.
will complete it so God is not done with us and he will never let us go regardless how hard it is he's going to be with us that's the good news that's the gospel in Christ and through Christ we can accomplish the things that he has called us to do let's pray father God we thank you for your word we thank you for your reminder today that you're always with us Lord and that you will equip and that you will enable us you're not going to leave us alone and Lord, would you give us the courage to leave this place knowing that you are a good, good father who loves us, who's willing to do everything, who's going to break every barriers so that we can live the life that you've prepared ahead for us. And we pray, Father God, that we will not depend on our own strength, but that we will come to your son, to the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is sufficient. And Lord, Help us to remember that your spirit resides in us. It's going to help us, going to lead us to truth. Who's going to encourage, empower us to do the things that we're not able to do on our own. So we thank you that you don't lower your expectations in our lives based on our limitation. We thank you for that. In your precious name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Tommy will be here in the front for a little while. If you want to know a little bit more about Resource Global, you're welcome to speak to him. If you need additional prayer, you want to talk to me or some of the staff, um, we'll be up here in front. So happy Sunday and see you guys next week. <laughs>